Hey, Oritas. Uh, yeah, I decided to uh, make a video response here. Um, this is going to be a twofer, actually. Um, I, I can't really do better than what uh, Urban Elf did uh, for the answer to question number one in terms of, like, uh, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, man, kudos to you, Urban Elf, for uh, remembering that, uh, that uh, uh, proof that first order logic uh, implies a non empty universe. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer a different question instead. I'm going to try to. There's, this video is going to be kind of a twofer, okay? It's going to uh, answer a different question. Okay, why is there order rather than disorder in the universe? Um, and uh, my hidden agenda here is I want to throw another pot shot at, at the Kalam argument for the existence of God. Uh, some of your videos, I mean, there's just like so many arguments um, that uh, uh, Craig and Moreland put up uh, for this 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 bogus proof. Uh, I'm gonna take aim at one of them, okay? Uh, every single one of these can be done this way, but in this, this particular video, I'm going to take aim at one of them and show why it is, it's like completely illogical to believe it. Um, so here goes. So the question is, you know, why is there order in the universe rather than disorder in the universe? Um, if you'll join me over at the chalkboard. Okay, so um, you gave an argument as to why the universe could not be infinitely old. Um, the proof goes something like this. Um, entropy is always increasing, uh, we obviously live in a universe which doesn't have maximum entropy. Uh, therefore, the universe just can't be infinitely old. Okay, so uh, my goal is to explain why this uh, proof is bogus. Okay, uh, as an illustration uh, for the universe, I'm going to choose another system which exhibits the same phenomenon, and you'll see immediately how it applies to the, the universe as a whole. Um, this is a, a simpler system. Take a two-dimensional array of bits. Okay, so for example... Um, this right here is a 10 by 10 array of bits, and this is a non-random array. So, so let's have this uh, illustrate as a state of low entropy. Okay, now this is a, uh, I generated these uh, bits by uh, using a random number generator, and this is a random array of bits. So let's uh, use this as illustrating a state of uh, maximal entropy. Okay, now the question is, Yes, the whole um, the whole array, the array as a whole, is random. But does that imply that every subregion in this array is also random? Uh, interestingly enough, the answer is no. Uh, you'll find like small regions inside of here, which actually are consisting of you know entirely of ones or entirely of zeros. Uh, so you know even though the array as a whole is is genuinely random, that doesn't imply that that any subset of this array that you'll take is also going to be random. Okay, now, uh, is this just an accident for this particular one, or is this a, a general phenomenon? Uh, actually, there's an interesting theorem, and it goes like this. Okay, so, so take any string of n bits that is chosen at random. Okay, so with probability 1, the string will contain a non-random substring whose length is pretty substantial, whose length is, is about the logarithm of n, as, if n is the number of bits. Uh, now, there is a beautiful proof of this, just absolutely gorgeous proof of this, um, given in the book A Como Girl of Complexity by uh, Leon Vitani. I I'd love to give this proof here, but honestly, this was like the, the second hardest book I ever read. It took me like five years to read this book, so I, I don't think I could squeeze the proof in a 10-minute uh, video. But basically what it says is, is that in order for a string of n bits to be random, it it's, it's a requirement. It, it, for the the string of n bits to be random, they're 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 pretty much with probability one has to be in non-random substrings in it. You can't make a a random whole only from random parts. In other words, if, or for there to be a random whole, it's it's inevitable that that some of the parts are going to be non-random. Okay, so we have a ten by ten array here. So I generated a different array using the same random number generator. Um, for, for a 10 by 10 equals 100 bits array, we'd expect 2 by 2 islands of, uh, of you know, non-randomness that's here. Okay, but uh, we could scale this up. We could make arbitrarily large islands of non-randomness just by making the, the bit matrix arbitrarily large, right? Okay, so how does this apply to cosmology? Okay, so yes, the visible universe that, that we know and love uh, seems to be far from maximal entropy just now, okay? But... Just because the visible universe has a low entropy, that doesn't mean that the universe as a whole has low entropy. Not at all. It just doesn't follow. Okay, all we have to do is assume that the whole universe is, is about, you know, 
exponentially larger than the current size of the universe, uh, which is huge, but still could be finite. You know, I know you're a big friend of a finite uh, universe. Um, so, yeah, it could still be finite. It just has to be, like, you know, way huger than what we can actually see. Okay, so this is 100% consistent. Actually, it's a requirement uh, for the universe as a whole to be at maximal entropy. So, so we could assume a finite universe that was infinitely old, that had already reached a maximal entropy state. Uh, but just because the universe as a whole has this maximal entropy state, in fact, even if it does have uh, this maximal entropy state, it's required okay, that there will be the chunks inside of it that are size, you know, log of the size of the universe, which are not uh, at maximal entropy, which are um, very regular. Uh, so yeah, Wirtas, um, yeah, let me just a second, uh, again, what uh, Irvin Elf said about uh, Craig and Moreland and this Kalam argument of God business. Um, you know, I, I really think you've fallen in with bad company uh, in terms of, of, of uh, Craig and Moreland here. Um, it really is intellectually dishonest what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're the intellectual equivalents of faith healers. I mean, you know, it's, it's, not as hard a work as ditch digging is. I'm sure it's, you know, way less stressful than my job is as a computer programmer. Um, I actually wish I could do what they're doing themselves. I, I think I could do a pretty good job of, like, you know, weaving, you know, very fancy-sounding arguments uh, in favor of, of uh, you know, the existence of God. But um, you know, I'm just I'm just too damn honest. I, I can't bring myself to do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think they're just, you know, they're snake oil salesmen is, is, is really what they are. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I guess, you know, basically what I'm saying is, you know, every single one of their points can be refuted like this. If there's another point of, of yours, which, which you think, uh, you know, really, uh, holds true or holds water, uh, let me know it and, and I'll look into that and I'll make a video which, which refutes that one as well. But, um, really there's, there's absolutely no reason to believe in the Kalam argument for the existence of God. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, very interesting questions.